Welcome to yet another English language A level video with me, Paul. And this one is about CLD. And what I'm going to give to you are 15 theories that are absolutely crucial for you if you are in the exam and you're doing a children's writing development response. 15 theories for you to learn. Here we go. Theory number one is from Jean Chow. And this is actually not about writing, it's about reading, because reading actually is a precursor to writing. There she is, Jean Charles. And it's Jean Charles' opinion that the learning and uses of literacy are among the most advanced forms of intelligence and compared to other forms, depend more on instruction and practice. That is a good quotation to remember. Two parts of it, that literacy is hard it's among the most advanced forms of intelligence. Of all the things that children cognitively they're learning in the early years, literacy is one of the most difficult things. And then secondly, that unlike speech, which seems to happen just naturally, so long as a child is exposed to speech around them, they're gonna start speaking themselves. Uh, reading and writing is a bit different. It depends more upon instruction and practice. So according to somebody like Vygotsky, they would say the MKO, the more knowledgeable other, is very, very important. Now, Chow came up with six different stages in reading development, and here they are. The first stage is not really a stage at all, because it's kind of pre-reading or pseudo-reading. It's pretend reading. It's the child sitting on the adult's knee, turning the pages, repeating memorized words, pointing at things. There may be some letter and word recognition, for example, the child's old name, but it's very, very limited. That is an important foundational step to take you into stage one, which is decoding. This is a very painstaking process of working out the relationship between phonemes and graphemes, recognizing letters, and this is where phonics kicks in, where you're identifying the individual letters and you're sounding them out. There's not much sense of a whole text going on. There may not be much sense of the meaning within whole sentences, because it's all about decoding laboriously those individual letters. By the time, however, you get to around about six or seven years old, we're into confirmation and fluency. We've got lots more confidence and accuracy the child is able to read in a much more accurate and fluent way and there's more sense of a text as a whole it's not just about decoding individual letters we climb then into stage three which is the fourth level which child is calling reading for learning this is late key stage two early key stage three in the uk this is where a child is using re reading to concentrate on meanings and they're accessing texts in all sorts of different disciplines. It may be geography, it may be history, it may be science. And a lot of the reading that they're doing is actual factual objective reading rather than the kind of narrative reading that they've uh, been exposed to a lot in those early years. Your fifth level, which is stage four, is called multiple viewpoints. This is where your teenagers who are at GCSE level or even A level, they are beginning to show understanding of things like perspective. They are recognizing bias. They are adapting their inferential skills. They're picking up on the kind of implicature that's going on in the texts. So quite sophisticated levels. And then ultimately your highest stage, Jean Charles is calling construction and reconstruction where the adult reader is synthesizing a range of different sources. Crucially, they're reading in all sorts of different ways. You know, some texts need to be skim read, others need to be scanned, some texts need very close reading. So there you've got your six stages, and, and there may be an opportunity in the data that you've got to show how the writing level of the child kind of matches up with some of these reading stages. We move on to phonics. So this is a classroom approach which encourages readers to break down vocabulary into individual letters of graphemes and sound them out. 
There's two types of this. There's the synthetic phonics, which is a part to whole approach. And it's getting uh, children to look at each individual grapheme and to articulate them, to pronounce them, s, i, p, and then blending those phonemes together into the whole word. That's called synthetic phonics. Maybe synthetic in the sense artificial, because when we actually read, we don't just do that. Our eye doesn't stop on each individual letter. So that's called synthetic phonics. And there's another form of phonics, which is called analytic phonics, which is more a whole to part approach where the child identifies the word first and then considers the relationship between individual phonemes and graphemes. Basically, the child's encouraged to clump bits of the word together into key sections. The first bit in the word is called the onset. The rest of the word is called rhyme. OK, so if you take the word think, for example, that digraph at the beginning, a digraph meaning a combination of two letters to make one individual sound, TH. So the TH digraph is the onset. And then the rest of the word, in this case, ink, is the rhyme. So people like phonics because it's um, systematic. It doesn't matter what kind of background of literacy that you come from, from a home. All the children are getting the same recipe. Um, and also, it's kind of like multisensory as well, because as you can see here from the picture, then children are encouraged to sound out the sounds uh, and link them to onomatopoeic words, basic words like that. So it's, a, it's very popular in the classroom, but it has been criticised. It has been criticised for focusing on sounds and letters rather than meanings. And phonics is different to the look and say approach, which encourages readers to identify words as a whole in order to read them. So this is the focus more on meaning. Uh, in a sense, it's less mechanical. Um, so children are encouraged to look at common words like and and see and went and to read them as a whole word. So it does require, however, children to memorise a large number of words. And maybe if you come from a background where you're not encouraged to be looking at words very much, you're not reading very much at home, maybe it doesn't give children the skills that they need to work out meaning. The look and say approach. On to our fourth theory, which is one done by a, a New Zealander called Marie Clay back in the 1960s called Emergent Writing. Now, it's always been considered traditionally that whilst children um, naturally pick up speech, they need to be able to go to school and to be taught writing. But Marie Clay came along and she said that actually children preschool do demonstrate lots of reading and writing like behaviour. So she's suggesting that actually knowledge about literacy precedes formal instruction in schools. And she's saying that actually children are very conscious of the world around them. They see that literacy seems to play such an important part in everyday life. There's mum always on her phone. There's dad reading the newspaper. There's the brother who is doing his homework. And so young children are very highly motivated to engage in literacy. It seems to be an important adult skill. So children acquire some literacy skills, argues Marie Clay, from the social environment around them. They go to the supermarket, they see, they see posters, for example, and when they get home, they scribble down pictures which kind of echo the things that they've seen around them. So, you know, they've got language that surrounds them all of the time. Crawl's writing stages are absolutely fundamental to doing a really good answer in your children's language development. Um, Barry Crawl, he argued that children go through four broad stages. These are so good because they encompass different language levels. It's not just about spelling or about vocabulary. It encompasses 
all of the different levels. The first stage is called preparatory, sensibly enough. This is preparation for developing skills. Children up to the age of six tend to be in the preparatory stage. There's an example in the top right hand corner of preparatory stage writing. At this stage, children are developing these fine motor skills to write. Gross motor skills are bigger scale um, motor things like, for example, the ability to kick footballs or to walk or ride a bicycle or to swim, whereas fine motor skills are smaller scale, more discrete motor skills. So look at any child's writing. Look here at the linearity, which means the ability to, to put the writing on a, on a single consistent line. And it takes quite a while to be able to grip that pen or pencil confidently and to control what you're doing on the page. In this preparatory stage, children are beginning to understand these basic principles of graphemic, phonemic correspondence, either link between sounds and letters, and of course, very basic orthography, which is just a posh word for spelling. The preparatory stage, there is a lot of scaffolding going on. So children will be working in their workbooks at school, and quite often it will be kind of like fill in the gaps exercises where they won't be required to be writing entire sentences by themselves. So scaffolding is important. And at this stage, speech and writing, they're very separate at this point. I mean, think of a six-year-old who at this stage is in the post-telegraphic stage and pretty confident and confident with their speech, but there will be nowhere near that level in their literacy. So there's a bit of a mismatch at this stage between speech and writing. You then climb up into the second stage in which the child consolidates their preparatory skills. So sensibly enough, it's called the consolidation stage. And this is usually for children between six and eight. There's a great example of a child in the consolidation stage. Essentially, the characteristic of this is that it's speech written down. In fact, children are encouraged to say aloud what they're trying to put down and to write it. Okay, so its characteristic features grammatically include things like short declarative sentences, um, incomplete sentences, lengthy compound sentences, often with clauses linked by coordinating connectives such as and and then and so. Like here, I'm going to Florida and we might go to the beach and I can swim. And of course, children do that because adults, when they speak, and habitually they speak in these lengthy compound sentences. So think of consolidation as being speech written down. Again, preset structures and scaffolding will play a part, maybe not such as big a part as in the preparatory stage, but certainly preset structures will be important. And of course, the importance of the MKO, the more knowledgeable other. Punctuation will be starting to happen. There's a kind of hierarchy on punctuation. So in the consolidation stage, you would expect children to be starting to use in a standard way things like capital letters for sentence beginnings and proper nouns, the use of commas between items in a list, question marks, etc. We then move into what Kral is calling the differentiation stage. So you're thinking here of sort of late key stage two, children age eight to 11. There's a good example of the differentiation stage. In this stage, there becomes a greater awareness of the differences between writing and speech. That's why it's called differentiation. So modal differences, you know, speech is essentially quite different to writing. And it's not just modal differences, but actually understanding genre differences as well. That if you're writing a letter to your head teacher demanding a change in the school uniform, that's going to be completely different stylistic features to a beginning of a ghost story. We have increasing confidence in handling standard English conventions. Um, grammatically, you're going to start seeing complex sentences. Okay. So you're going to see subordinate clauses in there, the use of subordinating connectives and relative pronouns, which shows a kind of higher level of cognitive thinking. Um, 
Here, for example, the fish was very lucky because the net was almost out of the water. Because the net was almost out of the water is an example of a subordinating connective. So more variety, more re a wider repertoire of different writing styles here, and the child beginning to write for different genres and purposes and audiences. The last stage, according to Kroll, is the integration stage. This is where children begin to acquire a kind of personal voice and they integrate together the various writing and speaking skills that they've learnt over the years and they adapt style in confident ways to the requirements of gap, the genre and the audience and the purpose. Narrative and descriptive skills develop and there is much better technical accuracy which doesn't get in the way of the experience of the reader. So a wider vocabulary uh, children are drawing upon. They're selecting things like quite subtle synonyms with powerful connotations. Okay, so Kroll's writing stages are pretty important. Here's another one that's pretty important, the rule-based approach to teaching literacy. Now this is, uh, the argument for this is that when a child understands the, the basic conventions of writing, by which I mean the kind of the rules of spelling and grammar and punctuation, then actually that child's progress is going to be quicker. They're going to learn much more quickly and they're going to move more quickly to producing understandable, appropriate, coherent texts. And when you look on the website of the British DFE, the Department for Education, it does seem that they are pushing a more rule-based approach because you've got lists there of things that the children must be doing by a certain age. So the children must be introduced to, the, to some of the following at the beginning of, well, age six or seven. So year two, they should be, according to the DFE doing these things, they should be forming nouns and adjectives using suffixes like beauty, becomes beautiful, they should be doing subordination and coordination and sentence formations like if it rains i'll take my umbrella and they should be doing expanded noun phrases and sentence formations so there's quite a prescriptive list that's laid down from which you could infer that the dfe are sort of uh, encouraging a more rule-based approach in school the alternative to that and this is theory number seven is the creative approach this is where a child should be allowed to experiment creatively with language. They shouldn't be strictly corrected all of the time. We learn often independently through trial and error. Um, and advocates suggest that by not focusing primarily on accuracy, we're making children less afraid of making mistakes. So children are, are gonna enjoy the experience of writing much more. They're gonna be more invested in it their self-esteem is going to rise, it's a better approach. And the, um, <clears throat> the name of the theorist that's mentioned in the AQA textbook is John Abbott and his favorite, famous hens and chickens, because he used the metaphor of battery hens or free range chickens to describe these different educational approaches. And he suggested that actually, the more independent and creative learners might be the ones thrive. We're now into theory number eight, our old friend Lev Vygotsky, the Russian linguist, who believed that although children are certainly active participants in language acquisition, they, are, they absolutely depend on individual support. Okay, so he introduces this concept of the more knowledgeable other to scaffold children's learning to help them move on to the next stage, helping move children through the zone of proximal development. So Vygotsky is one of those that spans speech and writing, and it's fair enough to draw upon Vygotsky, both in your speech question and in your children's writing question too. And Vygotsky believed that mastery of writing comes from using it to satisfy some kind of need or fulfill an intention. It's not enough just to get children to be writing classroom exercises, that actually what they're doing there needs to link in with 
things going on outside of life, outside of the classroom. Okay, we're now on to theory number nine. This is James Britton. He's a British educationalist who basically agreed with Vygotsky and he built upon Vygotsky's ideas. And when he looked at children's data, it, he suggested that in schools, children's writing does tend to fulfill three different sorts of purposes. First of all, and this is a really important element in primary school, is building a relationship with the teacher. So in that sense, writing is not just transactional, but it's interactional as well. So building a relationship with the teacher is an important element of writing. Um, organising and extending knowledge would be second element, organising and extending knowledge. And then thirdly, categorising and exploring experiences. And so he came up with sort of three different broad genres of writing that he noticed going on in the classroom. First of all, expressive writing, which tends to be subjective. It's the first type of writing that children tend to develop. It tends to be about first person experiences. It's egocentric, it's concerned with the self. And obviously at this stage, the child is exploring their own identity. Okay, the second and third stages are, well, Britain calls the second one poetic writing. So this is the kind of figurative language that you're likely to see in stories and poems, kind of literary techniques, the kind of dirty tricks that all kinds of novelists and poets get up to, like metaphor and simile and personification and imagery and onomatopoeia, etc. Okay, so this kind of writing is encouraged in the early years because it does get the child to think about the craft of writing. And then finally, we have transactional writing, which is writing for a purpose. Um, it's more objective. It can be report writing. It can be sets of instructions. And the key thing about it is that it's rather than being subjective, like expressive writing and poetic writing, this is detached. So the idea is that children are beginning to adopt a more impersonal tone. OK, so they're important genres of writing to remember. And while we're on the topic of genres, why not go to Jean Rothery, the Australian who did loads of research back in the 1970s and 80s. And her research was published on genre based uh, work. She based her research in Australian schools and she considered that the, the effectiveness of teaching writing uh, should be looked at through the purposes of the writing and how those purposes can be fulfilled. Now, these purposes, these genres, what are they? Well, first of all, you've got observation stroke comment, which is the kind of simplest type of writing. Then you've got recount, which is a kind of chronological description of an event. Like, for example, the trip out to some to the seaside is a recount. So it's subjective. It tends to be chronological. It's moving forward chronologically in time. And it tends to go on a particular structure. Starts with orientation. We then have the event describing what happened on that particular occasion. And then it ends with a reorientation. So that's recount. You then have report writing, which is more difficult because it's objective and factual, and therefore it links in with James Britton's transactional one. It's difficult because it tends to be non-chronological. If you're writing an encyclopedic uh, entry for a hippopotamus, then clearly you can't do that in a chronological way. So it's more challenging, it's more testing. And then the fourth genre that uh, Rothery focused on is narrative which you might be surprised to read there that it is the hardest to achieve given that children are exposed to stories from from dot from birth but narratives are very complicated things and so learning to do successful narratives is a very prolonged and complicated skill again children have to learn about structural devices how stories begin with orientations how they complicate something happens in the story which is a complicating factor how perhaps they are resolved in the resolution and stories indeed may have a coda, some kind of message that's given at the end. So those genres are pretty important to remember because if you've got a piece of data in the exam and it's trying to achieve a certain genre, it may well be one of those. 
We then into a couple of researchers that are not mentioned in many of the textbooks. This is the idea of constraints and it's put forward by uh, a couple of researchers back in the 1980s called Flowers and Hayes. They proposed that coherent writing is really based on what they call constraints. And they called these constraints knowledge, sentence formation and goals. Here's what they mean. For children to develop writing successfully, first of all, they need the ability to cognitively get their heads around the knowledge or the ideas. It needs to form in the mind and it needs to translate into some kind of linear form. Secondly, then the ideas have to be transformed into grammatical uh, structures. They have to be put into strings of sentences where a writer is following syntactical rules. And then thirdly, the task, now whatever the task is, it could be a story of a day at the zoo, it could be an academic essay, needs to have some kind of success criteria or as you know, in modern day colleges, assessment objectives. So according to Flower and Hayes, constraints are the important element in children's writing. Here's a different researcher called Taffy Raphael, and she focused in on what she called knowledges and she suggested that children's writing must draw upon three knowledges and she called these knowledges declarative knowledge, procedural knowledge and conditional knowledge. This is interesting. As a teacher, you might have been frustrated by your students being unable to use, for example, the possessive apostrophe. You've taught it to them. You've done exercises with those children. They seem to have got those, the, the, the placements of the apostrophe right in those exercises. But when it comes to free writing, they may not be applying it. So this is where Taffy uh, Raphael's uh, research comes in handy. So first of all, you have declarative knowledge. That a student might know what to do. They might know a rule about where to put the possessive apostrophe. They might have procedural knowledge. So they might know how to write the required punctuation mark, particularly when they're given exercises that are specifically about it. But have they developed the conditional knowledge which guides a writer when to use the punctuation in their free writing, in the right conditions, in the right circumstances, are they using that particular thing? So you might find evidence of these knowledges in a children's text. We're on to number 13. There he is, Dr. Richard Gentry with his famous spelling stages. Five of them. First stage for spelling or orthography is the pre-communicative stage. At this stage, um, it links in with Kroll's preparatory stages and it maybe links in with Marie Clay's emergent writing as well. You tend to get random letters and symbols. This is the child practicing their fine motor skills in gripping the pen and being able to render certain graphemes. Certainly at this stage, there doesn't seem to be letter to sound connection. So there's little sense of individual words and meanings behind those words. But then you go into the semi-phonetic stage where you get a lot of telescoping of letters so rather than writing out each individual letter of the word the child will just tend to use one particular letter from that word the child at this stage is achieving directionality so they're in english going from left to right and they're showing some phonemic graphemic awareness so let's say the child is trying to spell the word united that's how they might do it in the semi-phonetic stage You've got a bit of extreme telescoping going on there. The third stage is phonetic, and clearly this is going to link in with phonics, you know, synthetic and analytic phonics, where the orthography, the spelling, is just based on the sounds of the words. So children are encouraged to sound out individual words. So there you've got united, U-N-I-T, and it's got the omission, the omission of the E in the D there. So a good example of nearly standard spelling and phonetic spelling. What happens in the transitional stage is that the child is beginning to combine phonetic and visual approaches. 
and they're beginning to get the hang of some of the harder elements of spelling, like, for example, silent letters. Now, look at the way that this child has spelt the word united. In the phonetic stage, it's not a bad rendition of it, and it's just missing out one individual phoneme. Here, the child seems to have gone crazy. Of course, they're not going crazy. They're using their uh, inferential skills um, that, because they've learned the spelling of you as a second person pronoun, and they've come across the word night, and they've come across words that have ed as an ending. So there is a kind of logic behind it. You can link it in, I suppose, with that idea of nativism and Chomsky. Here is a child who is sort of by themselves, independently trying to work out the patterns of English until eventually you get to conventional stroke correct, which doesn't necessarily mean that the child is spelling everything in the standard way, but it means that difficult spellings have been learned and there is understanding of some of the more difficult elements of English, like, for example, the presence of homophones. That's Richard Gentry's five stages of spelling. But <clears throat> Richard Gentry is not the only one who's done research about spelling because we also have in the 1990s, Kathy Barclay, and she came up with seven stages of children's writing skills. And I put this under spelling because although she markets it as being about children's whole writing, it's mostly about spelling. So stage one, we have the scribbling stage where we have random marks on a page. So very much like emergent writing. Stage two, we have mock handwriting stage. So writings and drawings producing wavy lines, which is their understanding of lineation. We have cursive writing. So we have joined up letters. Stage three, we have mock letters where letters are separate things. And then stage four, we've got conventional letters, which usually involves things like writing of the child's name as their first word and child putting letters on the page, but maybe they're unable to read it as words. So these are the sort of very earliest stages, stage one to four, scribbling, mock handwriting, mock letters, and conventional letters. And then you've got the stage five, which is the invented spelling stage, where the child spells in the way that they understand the word should be spelled, which I'm guessing that you could relink to uh, the semi-phonetic stage of Gentry. Then you've got the appropriate or phonetic spelling stage, stage six. And then finally, you've got correct spelling stage. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's number 14. Number 15, this is one that's mentioned in the textbook about two levels of writing. These are two researchers, one's called Berita and the other one's called Scardamalia. And this is the idea that really writing develops at two levels. Your first level is the ability to tell knowledge. So let's say the child has been asked to write about their holiday. And so they'll throw down everything in chronological order about their holiday from memory without very much sense of somebody has to read this damn stuff. But level two is called knowledge transforming. This means that you've got much more a sense that somebody is reading this text. What are their requirements? You know, who's the audience? What's the purpose? And so an example of that would be producing a tourist information guide for the area. So as you climb through key stage one and key stage two, you know, the assumption is that you're going to see more level two tasks being asked of children. That's Beretta and Scandinavia, two levels of writing. Well, we've done our 15 bits of research, and if I were you, I say this every video, <laughs> I would get a piece of paper or on your phone, I would make a note of these 15 different writing development theories. How many of them can you remember? Here they are again. Reading stages, Jean Chow. Phonics, as opposed to the look and say approach. We have emergent literacy with Marie Clay. We have the writing stages of Barry Kroll. We have rule-based approaches versus creative approaches. We have Lev Vygotsky and his MKO doing scaffolding. We have things to do with genre. We have James Britton and we have Gene Rothery. We have uh, research done about constraints by Flower and Hayes and knowledges by Taffy Raphael. And then we've got some spelling theorists. We've got <coughs> Richard Gentry, and number 14, 
we've got Cafe Barclay, and then finally, the last one I told you about, those levels of rice and Barita and Scandinavia. If you get across these children's writing development theories, that's your AO2, that's half of the marks of what you're being assigned in your exam. So it's really, really important that you remember these, and uh, they should stand you in good stead. That's the end of my little video on this. Thank you so much. I will see you on another occasion.